So here we are again. We are streaming this finally. Last week we had problems with streaming. Um, we, I don't have anything I don't think that I'm going to be projecting this time. I anticipate that this class is going to be more a little bit of a discussion. If you don't want to have your voice online, that's okay too. And we can, we'll decide what we're going to do about this. Yes? There, it is a gender-based language. Hebrew is a gender-based language. So. That's right. It's different. Instead of, mm -hmm. and it is. You, in most languages, I think in the world are gender-based, and Hebrew is a gender-based language. So you need to know if you are masculine or feminine to talk. You need to know if the person you're talking to is masculine or feminine. You need to know if the objects around you, is the microphone masculine or feminine? You need to know those things. It's not that, just like in any language, the gender part of the language itself is a grammatical gender thing, but you will find out soon in those lessons, in the Hebrew lessons, we're gonna talk about some words I think that the, some of the insightful words are the ones that, are, that can go either way, that can be masculine or feminine and figure out how they're being used. Then it gets kind of really cool, I think. And you can, you can, because we can find secret insights in the Hebrew language, in the way the Torah is written and which words God chose for creating, I think it's significant to see sometimes when God chooses, it feels good to sometimes see insights in whether God is choosing a masculine word or a feminine word to create and to name things. So um, that's a good question, and we'll get to more of those answers. That's really good, because I find insights in it all the time. In fact, um, there's a, a morning prayer that we're supposed to say every day when we wake up. You're supposed to say, if you're a guy, you say, ani, I give thanks. If you're a girl, you say, ani. And there's a, 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 a guy who, um, Billy Jonas, wrote a beautiful, really cool, wonderful version of the Moda Ani song. And, um, and he changed the words a little bit in it. And we can talk about that another time, I guess. But he, he, instead of using the word melech, which is often translated as king or ruler or sovereign, he changed it to ruach, which is like spirit. And I don't know if there was something specifically about being a, a king or a ruler that made him uncomfortable, and ruach being a spirit feels a little more open, but it's obviously still gender specific. So I'm not sure what he was accomplishing by doing that. Um, but I was saying that this morning and it got stuck in my head with the different words. We can talk about that in insights. It's tricky to learn a language when you have no words, no concepts. Right now we're worrying about just those, those consonants. I wouldn't touch that because that's electrical and it could be dangerous. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's just dangerous. I don't like. I would never stop you if you weren't doing something dangerous, but that could be dangerous. So tonight we're supposed to be talking about God, and that's tricky. Sometimes it's easier to talk about what we think God isn't. I think, um, and sometimes we can talk about what God is. And one of the things that's especially tricky in Judaism is that you do not have to believe in God to be Jewish officially. And I know that confuses a lot of people. Um, there are a number of things about being Jewish, though, that should, that, that does imply a God. And one of the things that I think is kind of the most awesome lesson that I can teach about God, other than little ways of interacting with God, if you think about any religion that you know about, and, and that means one that you have studied, one that you feel you profess, one that you know about, and you think about their interaction with God and how they prove that there is a God. And then you think about Judaism, and you realize that Judaism treats God and proves God in a very different way than any other religion I know of. What do I mean? Here's, a, here's an interesting thing. You ever play that game Operator? So what, how do you play Operator? 
Like one person says a, a statement, and then you whisper it to the next person, and you whisper, 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 until you get to the end of the circle, and what happens to the thing that you say, usually? It's horrible. It's like no connection to what the original was. So what if we changed the way we played that game? And I would do that here, but I think that if we did it now, the people on live stream would like, think we're being ridiculous here, that all they'd see is a lot of heads going to the next person. But you know that that's true. We've done it too many times. We've all played this game. And you know that by the time it gets to the end, if I whisper to you, um, my umbrella has a hole in it, by the time it gets to the end, it could be bicycles are orange, and you have no idea how it got to that. I mean, you can, sometimes you go through the circle backwards, I always love doing that, to find out what they actually heard and why it changed to be something so totally different. What if instead, what if I were to whisper one thing to a whole group of people? How much do you think the story would change if it was a whole group that experienced what I said at one time? And that's the difference between the way God is revealed in the Jewish tradition, and God is revealed in most other traditions. In most other faiths that you know, there are very, very few people who have this proof experience of God. But in the Jewish tradition, what happens is you've got, according to Torah, it's approximately 600,000 countable people, which could have meant 600,000 men of fighting age. I thought we'd turn that off. Good men of fighting age, it could mean anywhere from, some people think that the thousand word may have meant, the hundred thousand may have meant troops, it may have been 6,000, or it may have meant like two million or more people, because if that was just some of an, this many men, a men of a certain age, then there were also children and there were women and there were older men, so it could have been somewhere between 600,000 and two million or more. Let's just use the number that the Torah uses and say 600,000 people. If 600,000 people all experienced the same thing, then when the next generation comes around and has to describe what it was that they saw, everybody's sitting around and telling the experience of, oh my gosh, and we were freed from slavery, and this guy Moses came, and we thought Moses was never gonna be able to do this, even though he was pretty cool because he grew up in the, in the palace, but Moses came, and we thought he wasn't gonna be able to do it, but man, did he show his God really showed the Pharaoh who was boss. And they all experienced the plagues. And they all experienced the exodus. And the reason why we eat matzah today is because they ate matzah then. It's not like something strange, somebody said, well, here's an idea. Eat very flat, very tasteless bread because that shows you that we have a God. No, it's because a specific experience that we all had, all had, and we've been doing the same thing ever since then. That's pretty powerful proof. It may not be enough for some people, but it's pretty powerful proof. So sometimes it's about the tradition of carrying down this story and doing it as a group as opposed to doing it the operator mode. Um, I know that some people think that the Torah was not written by God, that it was or divinely inspired maybe, that it was people who wrote it. But this experience is still a pretty powerful experience for us to be passing it down. So, and then to, and to, to kind of bring that home a little bit. So we have a couple of times in the Torah when God introduces God's self. Can you think of any times when God introduces God's self? So to Abraham, and what does God say to Abraham? How, how does God introduce God's self to Abraham? I think it was the other way. I think that Abraham kind of had it. What? The name tag. We're going to watch that movie next week. There is a really funny movie. It's one of the, the all-time biggest grossing movies in, and by grossing it means a few things, but biggest grossing movies in Israel. It's called, in Hebrew they call it Zohis Dom, which means this is Sodom. They showed it in the, in the Jewish Film Festival that we had this year, the, the Shreveport Jewish Film Festival. And Friday nights after services in the summer, we like to show movies, because it's still almost light out when we're finished with the movie after services. So we're showing the This is Sodom movie, not this Friday, this Friday is A Serious Man, but the following Friday, and, and it's got this really funny bit in the beginning where this guy who looks like a salesman, like a door-to-door -door salesman, he's wearing a suit and he's carrying his briefcase and he knocks on the door of Abraham, this guy in a tent in the middle of nowhere. and. Uh, 
And it says that it's God. And he says, oh, I forgot to put my name on. And he puts his name and it says the name, which is God. Anyway, um, it's very, very funny. I thought it was hysterical. I've watched it twice already and I'm happy to watch it again. Some people may not be happy. I mean, it is a Sodom story after all, but not of the things that you expect. Um, but it's kind of done by a group, which is uh, kind of the Monty Python of Israel right now. And it's just funny. So you're welcome to join us. Um, but that's what he meant by Abraham and, and God. Um, with Abraham, the interaction with God, we are taught a few stories, midrashim, which are, are kind of fill-in-the-blank things, these stories that have to do with God. We're taught a few stories about Abraham and how he discovered there's one God, which always used to bug me. You've heard me say this before, some of you. I was taught as a kid that Abraham was the father of monotheism. And I believed that for a long time until one day I said, wait a second, are you trying to tell me that like Ha-Adam, the first human, didn't know that there was only one God? Who's talking to him? They were hanging out in the garden. Of course he knew there was only one God. So how could Abraham be the father of modern theos, monotheism? And then 10 generations later is Noah. You think that Noah didn't know that there was only one God? Of course Noah knew there was only one God. He was having a conversation with God. 10 generations later is Avraham. And so this is the story. By then, 10 generations after Noah, people were worshiping other gods. And a few things happened. One is supposedly when Avram, which was his name before he had his go forth moment, but Avram, which also means father of a great nation, by the way, when Avram was three years old, according to the story, Avram looks outside and sees the sun and the sun is glorious and he can tell that the trees and the, and the flowers and everything kind of face the sun and wake up when the sun comes out and he says, wow, the sun must be the most powerful thing in the world. I'm going to pray to the sun. So Avram prays to the sun and stays there all day long. Don't ask me how a three-year-old is allowed to stay outside just praying to the sun all day. But nightfall comes and now there's a moon that pushed the sun out of the sky. So this little three-year-old says, wow, that moon is so powerful, it pushed the sun, the sun out of the sky. I'm gonna pray to the moon. And he prays and prays and prays to the moon. And he still didn't go home or go to the bed or I don't know what happened to him. But three-year-old Avram is, is very impressed by the moon now. And then you wait long enough and the sun pushes the moon right back out of the sky again. So this three-year-old little Avram says, you know, Obviously, it's not the sun or the moon that's the most powerful thing, but there's something more powerful that's making sure that it stays, the moon and the sun stay in its pattern. And so, comes up with God. And then we see Avram as a teenager, about your age, I imagine. And Avram's father, Terach, his job is to make and sell idols, the statues that everybody would worship. That was his job. Terach's job was an idol maker. And he was pretty good. He was a good sculptor. And so you go into Terach's shop and you see big, strong God idols and you see little teeny ones and fertility ones and food ones and wealth ones and all kinds of different ones. And Avram was a teenager and he had to help his dad in the shop. And one day dad says, hey, Avram, I've got to go to the bank. Would you please stay here and watch the shop? And I'll be back in a minute. And Avram says, of course, Dad, yes, sir. And so Dad goes away, and this lady comes in and says, I'd like to buy an idol, please. And Avram says, how old are you? <laughs> well, I never, you shouldn't ask a lady her, name, her age. And he says, well, I'm just saying, do you know that Dad made these idols like three days ago? Why would a woman with your experience be worshiping something that was made only three days ago? Why do you think that that has more power than what you need? That, you know, why is it so powerful? Well, I never, and she leaves. And then this other lady comes in and brings food to make as an offering for the idols and puts it down in front of this hungry looking idol. I don't know, so puts it down there and then she leaves. And then this really strong guy comes and says, I want to buy a strong idol because I'm strong and I want to, and he says, you know, how could you think that these idols are strong? They're just made of wood or stone. And they go, oh, never, and he leaves. There's nobody left in the store except Avram. And Avram takes a hammer that his dad uses to make the idols and he smashes all of the idols except for the biggest, strongest one. And he puts the food in front of the biggest, strongest one. And then dad comes home, comes back to the store. 
what happened? This is terrible. Oh my gosh, what happened? And Avram says, Dad, it was just terrible. This lady brought food for the idols and all the idols fought over the food and only the strong one won. And now he's got all the food and all the other idols are just dead and smashed and it's just terrible. And the father starts yelling at him. Avram, you're out of your mind. I can't believe you could have this. What are you talking about? I made these with my own hands. How could they be smashing each other to pieces? And Avram says, Dad, that's what I've been trying to tell you. You can't worship these things. You make these things. There is a maker that made us all. That's what you should be worshiping. That's how God supposedly was introduced to Avram. And then God sends Avram on a shalach lacha, go forth for yourself. And so now, for the first time in history, since there was some kind of civilization after Noah, there is a God, because in those days, the gods, it was kind of like sports teams, that wherever you lived, you rooted for your God from whatever that place was. And so, from that moment on, God followed and gave Avram a new name, gave Avram this letter to put in his name, which is one of the letters of God. And so, Avram, whoop, let's do it like this. I'll, I'll write it for you. Avram, when you plop in this letter, uh, letter of God's name, representing God, it becomes Avraham. You put God in, and he gets a new name. And his wife's name was Sarai, which can mean princess. And when you add God's letter to that name, it becomes Sarah. And then they got their new names, and they have a new destiny, and they traveled around, and wherever they went, God was with them. And they had a covenant with God. But that's not what I was thinking about, that kind of an introduction. What's another time when somebody says, talking to God and says, well, who are you? What's another time when God introduced? And what happened with Jacob? Yeah, so he fights an angel, and we don't know if it's an angel. It says it's a man. We don't know. And, uh, and the angel, and he says, I'm not letting you go unless you bless me. And the angel says, what's your name? And he says, my name is Yaakov. And he says, from now on, your name will no longer be Yaakov. From now on, you will be called Yisrael, because it means you struggled with God and you won. And in the very next sentence, it calls him Yaakov again. But, but it struggles with God. So that's another time where these three guys, Abraham, and Isaac and Jacob all had personal relationships with God and God entered into a covenant with them. There was this promise, a covenant. So how about the next time? I think Moses. When, when was it Moses? So the voice is speaking from the burning bush. And he says, he said, yeah. So he's listening to this bush, talking to him, and the bush says, go back to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses says, I, I can't do that. First of all, I speak really terribly. I, I just, I, I, you, you pick somebody else who speaks better. I can't talk. I've got a heavy tongue. And God says, no, I'll be there with you, and your brother will be there with you, and, and it's okay. You can handle this. And Moses says, he's imagining himself going there, and there's 600,000 or 2 million or something slaves, and there's the Pharaoh, and why are they going to believe him to leave? And he says, who am I going to say sent me? Who are you? What's your name? And God said, lots of people think that God said that Popeye thing. I am what I am. But that's not what he said. He, God said, Ehia, Asher Ehia, I will be. I am becoming. It was a future tense. It was a, what's called imperfect. It means it's a, an imperfect doesn't mean that it wasn't wonderful. Imperfect means it wasn't complete. It was something that was happening that was continuing to happen. And God said, I am becoming. That's who sent me. Say, I am becoming. What does that mean to you about having a God that defines who God is by saying, I am becoming? What does it mean? It's God is evolving. Does God evolve? Why would God evolve? Yeah. Not coming, becoming. Like, I used to be a caterpillar and I am becoming a butterfly. That kind of becoming. Why would God say, I am becoming? So, and I'm, I'm sorry I have to repeat what you say. It's not because we didn't hear you, but we're on. So, because it's flipping the perspective. It's not just that God is already what God is. But for us, God is becoming 
for us, that our, our needs are evolving and God gets to be for us what we need. Something like that. And I think that that's true. And I think if you look at the story, I think that you'll see that in some sense, in hindsight, you look back and you see that God is always the same. But in some sense, you look at it and you see that it feels like God is changing. Abraham, for example, has that cool story where God, it's the Sodom story. And you'll see it really well in the movie where they have this bargain and, and God says, well, Sodom is a rotten place and I'm going to destroy it. And Abraham says, you can't destroy it. There are good people. My nephew is there. Lot is there. You can't destroy it. What if you find, and he starts bargaining, bargaining with God saying, well, what if I could find like 50 good people? Would you destroy a whole city if there were 50 good people? And God said, of course I wouldn't destroy it. So did God just change his mind? Or is God becoming a something? Or there are other times when the children of Israel are free and we get to the other side and we are really happy and then we're really thirsty. I'm so thirsty. Boy, am I thirsty. Boy, am I thirsty. And God at some point starts well, or how about the, the golden calf? Or how about last week when we talked about spies? And God says, look, these people just don't trust me. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to start all over again. And that's what God wanted to do. And Moses says, no, you don't want to do that. That would be really bad for your reputation. You just took this whole people out of Egypt. You don't really want to destroy them. The whole world is going to see. Them. That's just crazy. You don't want to do that. That would be crazy. So God said, oh, yeah, you're right. Now, does that mean that God didn't know that it was right? No, it means that somehow we have to learn that we can interact with God. And I think that that was a wonderful way of learning, that we can interact with God. Would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were a wealthy man? I mean, you can talk to God. You can argue with God. And sometimes God wins and sometimes you win. And does that mean that that's not what God wanted all along? No, but it means that God is always evolving for us. I think that's a good one. So here's another one. We are all standing, all 600,000 plus, all the people who are there, from the young ones, the adults, all the people who are there, all the people who are going to be there in the future. That's what it says. It's setting the scene. And we are standing at Sinai, and we are about to receive God's word. And God says... I am, I, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. That's how God defines who God is. Why didn't God say, I am God, I created the world, I made you who you are, I gave you the spark of divinity in you, I commanded you to be holy because I am holy. Why didn't God say something about those things? Why did God say, as an introduction, I am God, I took you out of the land of Egypt? out of slavery, to be your God. Why was that the best definition? Why was that the best way that God could introduce so that we would follow laws? Because he had just done it. Mm -hmm. Because he had just done it. And we believed it because God had just done it. I'm going to tell you right now, I think it's awesome. I can give you all kinds of proofs that God exists because of creation. And I can tell you that there are probably billions of people in this world who don't believe that God created this world I can't help if they believe they don't believe, but I'm just going to say that if creation itself is not enough of a proof that there is a God for some people, I bet that there were just as many intelligent people then who said, well, what do you mean? You created the world. That's just crazy. There's just too much of a world to create. They might not have believed it. But this, they absolutely believed. They were now free. Yesterday they were slaves, and today, or 40 days ago, they were slaves, and now they're free. And they absolutely believe that because they just experienced it. And if you want to know who I am, I am the one who just freed you from slavery. You remember that? I am the one who did that. And we all experienced it together. And I think that that is awesome. And I don't think that you find other religions that have that as origin stories. I don't think so. Um, I'm going to say, because we have a lot of people here who are not Jewish, it's not a way of trying to convince you to be Jewish. That's not the point. The point is to see how awesome God is. We're talking about God here. We're not talking about us. <laughs> We're talking about God. A whole experience for a whole people. 
And I think that's pretty awesome. All right, so other things that God is, other things that God isn't. Um, sometimes we think of God, if I may, as being like a superhero. That we are feeling vulnerable and we wish that God would swoop down and pick us up. I mean, what's the hardest thing about believing in God is when life can't get any worse and you have whole faith and it doesn't get any better. I will tell you the, the story. Obviously, I tell this all the time. I've got some wonderful God stories to tell about how you know that God is there. And there's the one about, and I am sorry to say this, the way I heard the story was there was a terrible flood. It was a storm, and it was a terrible flood. And the building is flooding, and there's a guy who had to climb up to the second story of his house. And he sticks his head out the window, and there's a boat that comes. And the, the guys on the boat say, grab the, the preserver, grab that ring, just take the ring and we'll save you. And the man had lived a decent life. He wasn't such a great guy, but all of a sudden he had found God and he was living a really good godly life before this happened. And he said, you do not have to save me. I have perfect faith that God will save me. Go save somebody who needs you. And they said, grab onto the life preserver. We're here to save you. And he says, go find somebody else. I have perfect faith. God will save me. And it was still raining, and they couldn't stay there anymore, so they move on. And then a helicopter comes. Grab the ladder. And he says, no. He said, I have perfect faith that God is going to save me. Go save someone else who needs you. He's standing on top of the roof now. He's got no place to stand inside his building. His building is totally flooded. Grab the ladder. No, I have perfect faith that God is going to save me. Go save somebody else. So they finally, winds are blowing and they're being blowing around. They leave. And the water gets higher and higher and he drowns and he dies. And he gets to heaven. He says, this isn't fair. I had perfect faith that God was going to save me. I need to speak to God right now. And they said, sure. And they let him talk to God. And he said, God, I had perfect faith. I mean, I was really good. I believed in you 100%. Why didn't you save me? And God said, I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. What else can I do? Thank you. And sometimes that's a problem with seeing God. I think that happens a lot. I think that sometimes we have this image of what God is going to do to save us, and it's not what God is doing to save us, sometimes. I mean, that doesn't work in all situations, but obviously it works and doesn't work. All right, here's another one that's just as, as uh, funny, and then I'll tell you the serious ones. Um, my other favorite joke about it is about a guy who's got one of his most important business appointments coming up. And he gets early, he's dressed, and he's looking good, and he's feeling good, and he's ready to make this presentation. He gets in the car, he drives to where his appointment is, and he gets to the building, and he can't find a parking spot anywhere. It's in the city, and he can't find a parking spot. So he drives around the block once, he drives around the block twice. He drives around two blocks instead, maybe a bigger perimeter. He can't find a spot. He starts panicking. He started off early. Now he's lucky if he's going to make it to the appointment on time. And he says, God, please, you know how important this is to me. I'm a good guy. I just want to make it to this appointment. Please help me find a parking spot. Please, I'm, I'm, I'm good, and I'll try to stay good. Just let me find a parking spot. And he turns the corner, and he says, never mind. I just found one. <laughs> yeah. And so... That's sometimes, I think, the way God works also, is we're, not, we're just not seeing that God is there. So I'll tell you, one of the jokes that I had just heard that I have never told before in this context was that um, <laughs> there was a, I, I found this, believe it or not, on a Chabad page. I like this page. But it said, and I don't mean believe it or not, when you hear the end of the story, you'll say, Chabad, really? <laughs> but, but it was that uh, Japan and Russia and America were trying to create a spaceship that will go to Mars. And they worked really hard together and they finally create this ship and it launches and it goes and it lands on Mars and they're exploring on Mars. And all of a sudden they see a can that says Coca-Cola made in the USA on it. 
And so obviously, Japan and Russia were furious, saying, you've been here before, you've already done this, you lied to us, you, thought that you told us that you need us, you just wanted us for our money, for what? What did you need us for? You already made this, you've been here before. And America said, I swear, we have never, we, we couldn't, we needed your help, we really didn't do this, we didn't. how did this can get there? Well, obviously, you know, all of the molecules, it could just happen randomly, you know, I don't know, a can, it just formed a can, and it happened to form a can that says, Coca-Cola on it, I don't know. That's not very possible. Just like it's not very possible that this world can exist with human beings and other kinds of really awesome things. It doesn't happen randomly. There's gotta be a little bit of planning in there. At least that's the combination. But I like that Coca-Cola thing. I'm sorry, I like that one. Um, well, because he said that the, the can must have just created by random molecules becoming does it, can, does it, well, sorry, so there was another story like this. The king said, how can you prove that there's a God? And so the, he asks the rabbi, he challenges the rabbi, and the rabbi says, your majesty, if you could leave me alone for five minutes and come back again, when you come back, I can prove to you that there's a God. And the king says, okay, cool, and he goes away. And when he comes back, he sees on the table parchment in magnificent handwriting written in ink, this gorgeous, gorgeous poem. I mean, just magnificent poetry in beautiful handwriting, beautiful creation, sitting on the table. And the rabbi said, look, that's how you can prove that there's a God. And the king says, what do you mean? He said, well, all I did was, the rabbi says, all I did was take this bottle of ink and I spilled it on the paper. And all of a sudden, the spilling just started moving around and poof, that's what popped out. And the king said, that's ridiculous. The ink can't just turn into a magnificent poem. Well, that proves that there's a God. <laughs> we have to have, in order to prove that there is a world, there's got to have been something more than just spilling and, and randomness. Anyway, I'm not here to prove that there's a God. These are just silly things about that. I'm going to presume that there's a God because we're here to talk about God. And I want to talk a little bit more about the kind of God that saves us by sending us helicopters and sending us boats. Um, one of the things that's hardest for us to deal with about God is how can there be a God, how can we believe in a God after things like the Holocaust or 9-11, letting any innocent people be murdered like that, or Katrina, when people are hurt. Now, you will hear people, religious people, trying to claim that it's punishment, that these things are punishment that we did something terrible. Um, I, I can't, some of the awful things that people have said, they said that Katrina happened and 9-11 happened. I've heard rabbis say 9-11 happened because people forgot to check their mezuzahs every seven years. People complaining about, I don't think that's the way it works. I don't think that's the way God works. I heard a lecture once by um, Rabbi Kushner who wrote, when bad things happen to good people. He wrote the book because he lost a child. And that's a, an unbelievably devastating thing to happen to any parent. And you go on somehow, even when something that devastating happens, even though you're a good person, bad things happen. And he was, this, this was on, it was a TV document, not documentary, it was kind of a news thing, but it was in a, um, like a town hall forum kind of thing. So it was a situation almost like this, where he's standing at the front and he's talking, and they had a microphone, and people could ask questions. And somebody said, how can you believe in a God that can allow things like the Holocaust to happen, can allow things like 9-11, can allow things like Katrina to happen? And he said, if I have to make a choice between believing in an all-powerful good that is the cause of these horrendous things, or an all good God that cries with us, I believe in the all good God. And I always appreciated that. Or there was the tsunami that hit Japan and all of these people, so much life was lost. And so I was teaching the confirmation class, the ninth and 10th grade kids and one of the kids said, why didn't God stop it? Why didn't God, I mean, so let's say God doesn't cause this. Why didn't God stop it? 
And I said, how do you know God didn't? I mean, how do you know that it couldn't have been worse? What's happening with, uh, with Bill right now, with this thing that was going to be a hurricane that wound up got getting worse when it hit land instead of, usually it hits land and it slows down and it got worse because of the moisture and is it coming here, is it destroying us? How do we know that this isn't God stopping? We had, um, uh, we have a story in my family that I tell all the time about God. After Katrina and Rita, there was one day when I was sitting at home and I was putting on, and I remember this, it was clean socks. And I remember being struck all of a sudden by the fact that I'm in a safe house and I had clean socks to wear. And I just felt so grateful to be alive, to still have a house, to have clean clothes, to just be, to just be, to be comfortable. And I called out to my sons. I said, you know, we need to thank God. And Max said, I always do. And Ron said, well, I don't thank God for these things. And, I'm like, <laughs> and you learn the hard way that when your child says something that makes you want to strangle them or choke or whatever, you need to count to 10 and you need to say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> because it usually isn't exactly what you thought it meant. So I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, if I blame God for all the bad things that happen, if I thank God for all the good things that happen, I have to blame God when all the bad things happen. And I don't blame God for the bad things. And he was in second grade. And I loved that answer. And I, I tried to think like a second grader, to think how awesome that was, to, to feel that way about God, not to blame God for bad things, because I don't blame God for bad things. I just appreciate God for good things, but maybe you have to have both. And so I said, well, do you talk to God? And he said, yes. And I said, does God answer? And he says, yes. I said, well, what do you talk to God about? And I spent the next like two or three weeks thinking I was being surreptitious about this, sneaky about asking him, what is the mind of the second grader for God concept who does not blame God or thank God? What is it that he does? And um, I don't know that I got to what's inside of his brain, but a combination of what is in his brain and what was in my other son's brain and what I was thinking was something like this. When I was in high school, we used to talk a lot. This was as theological as we were getting about some of these things. We would talk a lot about what is God. And somebody described that in a world that is just flat, imagine that we were in a two-dimensional world. If I saw a dot, it would look like a dot. But if I saw, I'm looking like this, if I saw a line, it would look like a dot. If I saw a line this way, it would like go on forever. It would just be giant. If I saw a circle, it would look like a line if I'm living in a two-dimensional world. So we, in our high school wisdom, said, well, what if God is like a sphere in our two-dimensional world? So I can't even imagine the circle, let alone the dimensionality. So that was really cool in those days. I thought that was awesome, to think that God was so far beyond what we could imagine. But when my second grade son challenges me with this, we came up with something like this. We said... God created the world. And imagine that the world is something like a maze. And that you are going around in the maze and you're trying to get to wherever your goal is, whatever that is. And every once in a while, things happen. Like God created the maze and got, you know, the butterfly wing thing. So all of a sudden, God created the maze and there's going to be winds, and there's going to be water, and there's going to be these things. And sometimes the water is going to build up really high. And it's because of the way the maze is going to go. And so if you happen to be living where that water is going to be, you're going to get zapped by the water. It's not about bad or good. It's just about the choice you made to live where the water is going to be. You may not know that there's going to be water there. You may know there's going to be water there, but it's your choice to live there. You get to make choices in life. And so you live with these choices. And some things God set in motion and God isn't going to stop it. God doesn't have to stop the water from being where the water has to be. God doesn't have to stop that. It's really okay for the water to be there. If you choose to live there, 
You have to deal with the consequences. And so you are walking along the maze, and every once in a while you're in a dead, dead end. Or every once in a while you don't know which way to go. You can talk to God, and God is here watching. And you say, God, I feel lost. And God will say, all right, you need to take a left and two rights, and then you'll be back on your path. And you say, thank you, God. And then you make your way again. That I do feel, and even my second grade son felt, that you can talk to God and God can give you good answers. Is God going to swoop you up, save you? He's going to send a boat, maybe. Yeah. So Angie said that she feels like she talks to God a lot and she doesn't always, never or sometimes doesn't get answers. So that's a good question. So how do we know that we're getting answers from God? What? How do you know? Yeah, sometimes it's not a saying. You won't hear a voice. Sometimes it's things. Can you give an example? Did you hear what she said? So she was saying, so if she asks God a question like, can I go to the pool? She doesn't hear an answer. But then when she goes to the pool, she knows that that was an answer. There was a story like that about this little girl who was playing with her dolls and, and the head popped off of the doll. Has that ever happened? You ever play with a doll? You ever see the head pop off of the doll? So the head popped off of the doll and her brother walks by and sees her trying to squish this head back onto the doll. And he was actually a good brother and he comes and he says, hey sis, you want me to help you with that? And she says, no, um, I asked God to help me with it. <laughs> he starts cracking up. He says, no, it's really, it's no problem. I'm happy to, you know, sent a helicopter, I guess. I'm happy to help you put that head back on. She says, no, it's okay. I asked God to help. It, it'll be okay. And so he says, fine, whatever. And he goes away. And he comes back a little bit later, and he sees her, and she's playing with other dolls. And the doll that had the head off still has the head off sitting on a chair in the corner of the room. <laughs> and he's going to pick on her now, and he says, ha, I thought you said you asked God to help you put that head back on the doll. And she said, I did. He said, no. <laughs> Sometimes people are, are better at hearing the answers than others, and they're okay with that. Um, I think that's, that's also very true sometimes is hearing that answer. It's a little bit like finding your parking spot, though. I joke that when I'm driving down the road, if I get all green lights, then I say, thank you, God. But if I get all red lights, I don't complain. I don't say, oh, there's no God <laughs> or something. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder why they're all red lights. What am I learning? You know, What, what lesson is it? Was there a, an accident that I avoided or something like that? There's a, and is it always about me? And is, it, you know, is God always there for you? That's the saddest part. We have people in the congregation who tell me that they do believe in God. They do believe that there is a God that created this world, and they also believe that God created all of the worlds, that they think that our universe and all of the universes are so vast that there must be life forms on other planets and other places and other universes. And so even though they do believe that there's a God, and maybe the God is watching over all of this, that God that's watching over all of the vastness of all of the universes can't be paying attention to little old me. That makes me sad. I don't see why God can't be paying attention to little old me. I don't see why not. I feel it. Um, I'm not always sure how to find those answers. I don't always know. There is a Jewish saying that says, when I pray, I'm talking to God, and when I learn, God is talking to me. And sometimes it's things like that. Sometimes it's finding an insight. It feels like... I, I like to think about it in another way, too. So almost everything we do, you know, in Jewish tradition, we're supposed to say 100 blessings a day. I mean, it's not supposed to. You, you live life realizing that there's more than 100 opportunities every day to appreciate what's going on. And so 
I sometimes think about a blessing. So let's say I am about to eat an apple, and I say, praised are you, God? And God says, yes. And I say, you make fruit grow from trees. And God says, you're welcome. Or God says, that's pretty cool, isn't it? I can make fruit grow from trees. I could do that. Sometimes I think that when we say blessings to God, I think God, it, God appreciates things in a new way, I think. I mean, God knows God made tree, fruit from trees. But sometimes when you're sitting there and you're about to bite into it, and you say, thank you, God, you made fruit from trees. This is delicious. God says, yeah, that was pretty cool. And I think it helps us to remind God how cool God is. You think that God wouldn't need that, but I like knowing that we do. I like knowing that because we are appreciating the world, God is, is uh, feeling appreciated, recognizing how wonderful it is. Everybody needs that. Uh, it reminds us how to treat other people because that's one of the most awesome things that we know. I love to thinking about the creation story as it shows in the Torah that says that we were a lump of clay and God took, the way it says is God took God's nose and blew life into us. And now we have the spark of divine in us, each one of us, and we're each created in the image of God. Whatever that means, I know it's true. We're all alive. I know it's true that we all have this, whatever that spark of God is. And so you look around and everybody you come in contact with has that spark somewhere. There's a spark in them, potentially. And then I love knowing that what God has commanded us to do is to be holy. That's a commandment, be holy. And why is God saying that? Is God saying be holy because, you know, you should always try to strive to be your best or you should always try to strive to be better than others or you should always try to do a good thing, be a good boy? <laughs> is that why God says be holy? Nope. God says be holy because I am holy. I love that. Be holy because I am holy. So what is God? God is holy. And what are we? We have the spark of godliness in us, and we can be holy too. I love that. So I don't know what else it was that you had come to study about God. I'm ready for more questions. I haven't run out of jokes and stories, but did you have other questions or answers about what God is or what God isn't? It's not always easy. I mean, I'm not going to pretend that it's always easy. And I will tell you something that I really, really, really don't understand. I really don't understand why good people suffer. I just don't understand that. There are an awful lot of things in this world that I get. But that's one thing I just don't understand. Yeah, the little babies die. I don't understand those things. Yeah. Yeah, go. So, no, that's, is it God's job to, to, mm -hmm. that's your job because you're being a doctor. Um, in Jewish tradition, that's exactly how we feel. In fact, if you read, you know that I'm really bad at chapter and verse in Torah, but I can do 2-1, I can do 1-1, one, one. I'm really good at 1-1 one, one through 1-5, I can do 2-1 where it says, that, that God finished the heavens, the skies, and the land, and all of its host. And then it says that God completed God's work. It doesn't say that God completed creation. It said God was finished with God's work. So one of the ways that Jewish tradition teaches us we're supposed to deal with the world is that, like I said, God created that maze. God created the world to be a world, and the world just does what worlds do. It, be, it is. It is our job to take responsibility for this world. It is our job to take care of the animals and the plants and the people. It's our job to do that. It is no longer God's job to be taking care of all of those things. 
I think that God is kind of like, uh, some we used to say like a coach. So God has this playbook and God is showing you the plays. If you've ever played a sport, especially a team sport, even if it's not, even if it's like tennis, you just keep doing the same motion over and over again so that when you're in a situation where, you're, where it counts, you're already ready. You know what you have to do. It's already ingrained in you to do what you have to do. But you take, I don't pick up basketball. We just finished the basketball finals, right? So you take a sport like basketball and God has shown you the playbook and now that you're in the game, God can't do anything for you. God can't make the ball go into the hoop. God can't block the ball. God can stand there on the sidelines and say, go the other way, you're going the wrong way. Or defense, defense, or whatever it is that coaches are going to scream from the sidelines wanting you to do a good job, but only you get to make those choices. In Jewish tradition, God created us, and God created us as good with the capacity to make choices. We can make good choices and we can make bad choices, but it's our choices, our choices. God is always on the sidelines cheering us on, saying, make good choices, make good choices. You want to know what a good choice is? Let me show you. Here's some good choices. These are what good choices look like. Make good choices. And then we try. So sometimes I like that coach idea, that it exists, the process exists, and God is just cheering us on. But God does not necessarily have a role in what else is going on. Does that make sense? Did you have something? Go ahead. That's, you know, I know a lot of people who think of it that way. That he said, like when you mentioned when babies die, or is it maybe a punishment for doing bad things? The problem with thinking that way is it's not like the baby did anything bad. A and in Jewish tradition, life is so valuable that there is almost any commandment, no matter how important it is, you can break it to save a life. That's how important life is. And so to think that God was using a life as a lesson taking a life as a lesson because I did something bad, so somebody I love is dying, I, don't, I really don't think that's how God works. I think that that's mean and cruel, and it's like what I said before. If I had to believe in either an all-powerful God or a God that, that cries with me, I think when that baby dies, I may or may not have been a good person. I mean, there, there are times when it, you can see that it's obviously because of choices. If I'm a crackhead and I give birth to a baby, and the baby dies because of, of crack addiction, it was my choice, is it a punishment to me? I made really stupid choices in my life, and there are consequences to those choices. Was God punishing me by making that baby die? I don't think that's how God works. That's not the way I see God. I don't see it as being, um, and that's why I said before, in Jewish tradition, we believe that we are all created good, and we make choices. Um, but the, it's not so much about the punishment as it is about trying to see what the good way is and making a decision to go back to a good way. I think that there, I think God is, is big enough to make better um, signs for us. I mean, can, can we learn from what other people, what happened to other people? Oh yeah, we can learn from other people. <laughs> there was a, I don't know, a pillow or something that said, it's really a good idea to learn from other people's mistakes because life is too short to make them all on your own. <laughs> you know? So if you see your sister touch the stove and she burn her fingers, you don't really have to touch it also to learn that it's really hot. You could really learn a lesson from that. Um, you should learn lessons from mommy and daddy saying, you know, don't run at the swimming pool. There's a good reason why they say that, you know? And it's not because they're punishing you for well, something. It's because they know you're going to slip and you're going to hurt yourself and everybody else near you and whatever. I mean, it's a good thing. Um, I, I really don't think, I don't think. Now, uh, let me tell you, in Torah, there are lots of times where it talks about God says, make good choices or there will be consequences. There are times when there are consequences. But I don't think of the consequences as God coming and zapping. That's not how I see it. 
if I choose to make a stupid decision, if I drive too fast, is God punishing me by making me get into an accident? No, it was my choice. Is it a lesson I'm learning? Yeah. Do I pray I didn't kill anybody else? Yes. And who, you know, were they learning a lesson because I was making a stupid choice? I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way as being worried. I think that God is not worried about our sins as much as God is worried about us making good choices. If you think about God as cheering you on to make good choices all the time instead of finding ways to punish you for bad things, for sins, I think you'd live a lot happier life. I think, you know, life is, is actually really good. You wake up in the morning saying, what kind of good things can I do today instead of how many ways can I not get punished today? You know, it's a, it's a much more comfortable way of living. And I think that's the way, I think that's the way God works. It's more about... Um, in uh, a little bit like this. In the, the, it's, the Talmud says, mitzvah goreret mitzvah, avera goreret avera, that if you do a good deed, if you do a mitzvah, if you do commandments, it leads to other commandments. If you do bad things, it leads to other bad things. Um, and I don't know if you know this. In Jewish tradition, sin, the word for sin, chet, is... The same word, have you ever done archery? So if you've done archery, if you take a bow and you aim at a target, it is really rare that you're going to hit dead on bullseye. A lot of times you'll get to the target somewhere, but it's really rare for you to hit the dead on bullseye. Maybe you're good. Maybe you can all the time. But most of us, we aim and we get, we're lucky when we get it on the target most of the time, anywhere on the target. Sometimes it doesn't even go on the target. The wind comes or the something happens or we slip or the, there's, there's not enough tail feathers or something and we don't even get it on the target. The word in Hebrew for chet is when you miss the mark. That you're trying and you blow it, whether it's close or far. So you get a chance to pull that arrow and try again. That's the way we look at it. And one thing that I do believe is that God is a very forgiving God. I don't think that God's purpose is to be watching us to punish us as much as it is looking for ways to keep us holy. That's what I think. So why did he, so he's asking why did God make men? Is it to take care of the earth? Is it to worship God? Um, what's the point of man? Meaning hum humans kind of man? What do you think? What do you think? Is it just to punish the man or no? Is it to take care of each other? Um, Is it not? Or was it just an accident? The stories that we learn in Torah, if that's a good indicator, and the way I started the lesson was it's a great indicator because it's something that we have been, unlike operator, <laughs> it's something that we have been continuing to tell the same story for thousands of years now. So I'd like to think that there's some kind of validity to it, if for nothing else than for longevity, in a sense. Um, you know, in Jewish tradition we say that if if you have a custom that everybody does, that it becomes, most people do it. it, it takes on the weight of a law. So I see that. In Jewish tradition, we see in the creation stories that God created humans and the humans had to take care of the world. And we had a responsibility to the animals, to the plants, we had, to each other, that we had that responsibility. I like to see it as God created us to be partners I mean, like, like what we said about, you know, if there are sick people, God created us because God doesn't have to go around zap, 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 zapping everybody better. God created us so that we can get better, so that we can help each other get better. And so why would you create a world where if you didn't create humans, then there wouldn't be a need for help finding people to help each other get better? 
because it would be boring without it. There's a cute story about, and have you read the, the book about the, the book of J? So you know that there's a theory that God didn't give the Torah to Moses on Sinai, that there were these other authors. So one theory is that there's an author that they call J. And some of that theory is that the J author may have been, there's a, a book called the Book of J, written by a guy named Bloom, a British guy. And Bloom says, um, I think this is who it is. So he says that he thinks that the, the J author was a woman in King Solomon's court, possibly a relative of King Solomon's, and that you can tell certain things about her because in most of the J stories, women were heroes or played prominent parts. So for example, um, in the story about Jacob and Esau, why does Jacob try to trick his dad? Because his mom told him to. I mean, she plays a prominent role here. The guys are kind of all wimpy in that story, and she's really the, the one, the mover, the shaker. Um, and so, and so you, you start looking at the stories that he says are Jay stories, and you start looking at those women, and you start saying, hey, yeah, he's kind of right about that. Or I mean, It may be wrong, but you can't lose it. But one of the things that it says is that in the Jay stories, God is childlike. What? Childlike? How could God be childlike? So imagine this. God is sitting in a sandbox and taking dirt from the four corners of the sandbox and forming this human shape and blowing air from God's nose into the clump nose and now you've got this thing. And it's, oh, look, this is fun. I can play with this thing. And, uh, and God says, oh, look, and uh, there are animals, and I want you to play with the animals, and go play. And uh, oh, you can eat from all the trees, but don't eat from that tree in the middle. And don't, you know, like it feels childlike sometimes when you think of the story. Why did God create humans? That's kind of a cool thing to ask. Here we are wondering about God, and then we're wondering, what does God think about man? I like that. Um, I'd like to think that it's kind of a good, a good thing to think about. What if we lived our lives in ways that would make God proud that God created us? What if God didn't know? What if it was an experiment? What if it was just, you know, that Coke can <laughs> just came out of the stuff that God had created and poof, there's a Coke can, poof, there's humans. What do we do with that? You know, what if we then prove to God that this was a good idea? We're not doing a very good job of that most of the time right now. I think we've um, made a little bit of a mess of this world, and I hope that we can fix it. There is a, a long period of time where we thought that um, we pray. In Jewish tradition, we pray for Messiah. We prayed and prayed and prayed, and, and it was really helpful because at times when things got the worst, it gave us hope. But I like the new concept where it says we can still hope that there's going to be a Messiah. We can still hope that there's going to be this world where everything is going to be wonderful. But wouldn't it be cool if we created that world and the Messiah got here and says, oh, look, no poverty, no hunger. I like this world. This is good. I mean, why do we have to have it be that someone else is going to save us? Why can't we make this be the world we want it to be? Be holy. Why? Because God's holy. Be holy because it's the thing to do. It's the right thing to do. That's what I think. All right. It looks like time is up even on the clock on the wall. Um, what is it that we would like to discuss next week? We have uh, another Wednesday that we'll have second Hebrew lesson. But is there a specific topic in Judaism that you feel you need to, you want to do next? The world to come. You want to talk about the world to come? We could talk about the world to come. Ha'olam haba, the world to come. Is that heaven? Is it not heaven? The good news is we don't know because we haven't been there to come back or not, but I can talk about different ways that uh, Jewish tradition talks about the world to come. I'm glad that everybody's here. Thank you for coming to this. I enjoyed this. I hope you do. I'm still trying to work out how to do this, especially since we're streaming it, and it's a little awkward, but I enjoyed this. Thank you.